All right, and a focus on Africa was also something George W. Bush had during his presidency. Back in 2003, he announced his emergency plan for AIDS relief, known as PEPFAR. To meet a severe and urgent crisis abroad tonight, I propose the emergency plan for AIDS relief. This comprehensive plan will prevent 7 million new AIDS infections, treat at least 2 million people with life-extending drugs, and provide humane care for millions of people suffering from AIDS and for children orphaned by AIDS. I had some disagreements with my predecessor, uh, but one of the, the outstanding things that uh, President Bush did was to initiate the PEPFAR program. It's a huge investment in battling HIV AIDS, uh, both with respect to prevention and also with respect to treatment. 20 years ago, under the leadership of President Bush and countless advocates and champions, he undertook a bipartisan effort through PEPFAR to transform the global fight against HIV AIDS. It's been a huge success. He thought big. He thought large. He moved. As you saw there, uh, President Bush's successors agree. The program turned out to be a massive success. And joining us now, columnist for The New York Times, Nick Kristoff. Nick posted a video essay entitled, In This Story, George W. Bush is the Hero, where he breaks down the program's lasting effects and poses this question. By not giving Bush the credit he deserves, did we fail to encourage future presidents to take similar bold action? And I think that's a great question. Nick joins us now at might have. It, it, it's always struck me, Nick, that that uh, obviously uh, the Iraq war has framed the Bush presidency, uh, but it has always been surprising. I've written about, I wrote about this a decade ago, that if you asked, like, you know, if you ask the people that worked in Africa, if you ask humanitarian agencies, uh, and I remember Bob Geldof, a guy who's considered a yeah. saint for what he's done uh, in, in, in Africa, people would say, well, why are you hanging around George Bush? Why? why? And he cut him off and he'd say, because he's done more for Africa than all American presidents combined. Bono said the same thing. Yeah. I mean, this is not something you expect to hear from a liberal New York Times columnist, but Bush was transformative for the future of Southern Africa. I mean, 25 million lives, that, there's just nothing that compares to that. This, you know, like saving every Australian. And uh, he did it. So he saved 25 million lives through this program. That's right. It was partly by providing uh, antiretrovirals to people who had AIDS and partly by prevention. For example, women who had AIDS and often transmitted in childbirth, there's a drug you can take to give that woman that dramatically reduces the risk of transmission. and. Other presidents have continued it. We're up to 25 million lives. And so absolutely, you know, Iraq is real. Guantanamo is real. Abu Ghraib. And I hammered Bush for eight years over those things. But 25 million lives, that is also real. And I think we have Two to Two things can be that. true yeah. at the same time. And, 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 and Reverend Al, I remember back in the early 2000s among the evangelical community, the white evangelical community, the black evangelical community, you heard people talking about AIDS in Africa. AIDS in Africa. We've got to do something about AIDS in Africa. There is no doubt if you ask George W. Bush, it was his evangelical faith. We talk a lot about evangelicals, but it was, it was his faith that made him move on this issue that ended up saving 25 million lives. And I think he was sincere about it. And no one was more anti-Bush than I was. I marched on him from everything from Katrina to him getting up in the morning. But uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that he literally did something that uh, saved so many lives in Africa. And I think the reason it's important with Nick Wright is that he did it at a time when many Africans and African-Americans were questioning uh, the medical uh, and and the the kind of of of, of, of uh, needles that they were bringing in, and they did it anyway because a lot of people were going to the Tuskegee experiment, which we had gone right. through with COVID, and he did it anyway. And to save those amount of lives, uh, I, I think is something that even gives us more credibility to give credit when credit is due. So you don't look like you're just somebody that is inflexibly against someone. He literally did something that was uh, extremely necessary that saved millions of lives. You have to give George Bush credit yeah. for that, Nick. How
how did this become such a priority for President Bush? You see him at that State mm -hmm. of the Union address in 2003, and it's hard to imagine, certainly Donald Trump, right. but maybe even any Republican who comes after making this such a centerpiece of his administration. Why was yeah. it so important to him? You know, it's funny, because looking back, it wasn't as if uh, we in journalism were calling on him to do this. Right. It wasn't as if the New York Times was running editorial saying this. But uh, the evangelical community, as Joe said, was pushing it. And Michael Gerson, his chief speech writer, mm -hmm. um, said, you know, they, Bush went around the table and asked everybody, should we do this? And Gerson said, look, if we don't do something that has a chance to be so transformative, save so many lives, you know, history will judge us harshly, something along those lines. And Bush did it. And I, I knew how much of a difference it had made on one trip to Southern Africa, and I talked to coffin makers in Malawi and Lesotho, and the coffin makers were complaining that because of PEPFAR, their business had collapsed. Wow. That made oh me feel God. wonderful. Wow. So talk to us about the other point you make, though, that the reluctance to give Bush credit and with the baggage surrounds him we just established has perhaps scared off future presidents from trying to take on something this big. Yeah, I think that in general, we in journalism, you know, we always hammer presidents for risks that go bad. We don't acknowledge when they take risks and things work. Um, you know, Obama, I was so critical about him on, on Syria, and I think that was a real failure. But he intervened to save the Yazidi, and, um, you know, nobody in Mount Sinjar, nobody remembers that. He avoided a genocide in Mount Sinjar. And looking back, I wish I had given him credit. I wish journalism and general issue voters had given him credit, because maybe the next president would be more likely to avoid genocides like that. Well, you know, um, it really raises a bigger question about the complexities of being president of the United States. Iraq, an absolute disaster. An absolute disaster, and there's no but after that. An absolute disaster, period. You could go back to John Kennedy, and anybody that saw Ken Burns' documentary on John Kennedy said, we can never win in Vietnam, but I can't pull the troops out of Vietnam until after I win my reelection. You've got LBJ saying the same thing. We can never win in Vietnam, but I can't be the one to pull the troops. And 57,000 Americans died, millions of Vietnamese died. Um, and, and we have this with every president. We have it with Jimmy Carter right now. Mm -hmm. Carter, who is seen as this failure, you look back. Oh, we just celebrated yeah. the 30th anniversary of, of the Camp David Accords, which ground wars in the Middle East used to happen all the time. They stopped after that. But you, you, you look at the opening of China. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's so many things. But don't you think that we're more comfortable with complexity in the case of Democratic presidents? Oh, and if of you think about, you know, LBJ, of course, we acknowledge right. the great things he did, the war on poverty, food stamps, Medicare, Medicaid. And we also acknowledge the tragedy of the Vietnam War. In Bush's case, I think we have a tougher time acknowledging that complexity. I will say that I, I'm so glad you brought him up because I will say that LBJ was just hammered by the left for Vietnam, rightly. Correctly. For yeah. years. And that, but that's all he was thought about. It took 50 years for people to say, wait a second, black people in America, yeah. they yep. weren't, and I, I'll direct this to you, Rev, black people in America weren't fully engaged by our Constitution as citizens until LBJ. So we've got to deal with the lies and the deceits and all of the deaths of Vietnam, along with the man who actually mm -hmm. helped move us toward a more perfect union and made Jefferson's words a little more real. No, literally, uh, Lyndon Johnson did more than probably any president since Lincoln and probably even more than Lincoln because he made law. And I, I remember I was a teenager when I joined the civil rights movement in New York. I was from the North. And we marched against the war in Vietnam, war against, uh, against the war in Vietnam. And one of King's lieutenants who was mentoring me said, you do understand he did the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and Open Housing Act, and that if it wasn't for him, life would be much different. And I was like thinking, this guy's a sellout defending him. But these are concrete landmark things. There wouldn't have been a Barack Obama or Kamala Harris if it hadn't been a Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. I don't apologize for being against the war in Vietnam, but you cannot judge him by just one situation. No.